From 1853 to 1856, the European great powers fought a bloody conflict to determine the balance of power, resolve the Eastern question, and for religious glory. Armies and navies battled on three continents in a war some called the Last Crusade. It's the Crimean War. In the mid-19th century, the European order established after Napoleon's downfall in 1815 is under threat. The once mighty Ottoman Empire has fallen behind in modernization and technology since the late 18th century, earning it the nickname the Sick Man of Europe. This increases tensions among the other great powers since Ottoman weakness threatens to upset the balance of power, a problem known as the Eastern Question. It's a problem that also leads to numerous Russo-Turkish wars from the 1760s to the 1820s, which the Russians mostly win. By the 1850s, some Russian leaders dream of an Orthodox Christian empire centered on Constantinople and expansion in Central Asia. The Ottomans, of course, want to preserve their state, but they need alliances with other powers to assist them, even when Britain and France demand concessions. For their part, Britain, France and Austria do not want to see Russia gain too much at Constantinople's expense. One of the prestige questions that has long created tensions is the status of Christian minorities in Ottoman lands. Russia sees itself as protector of the Orthodox, while France supports Roman Catholics. In 1852, the latest dispute is raging about which clergyman should have access to the Church of the Nativity in Ottoman-ruled Bethlehem, one of Christianity's holiest sites. French Emperor Napoleon III sends the warship Charlemagne towards Constantinople to back up his demands. Ottoman Sultan Abdul Majid I relents, which enrages the Russian government and the very religious Tsar Nicholas I. In February 1853, Russian envoy Alexander Menshikov travels to Constantinople and demands the Sultan reverse the decision and recognize Russia as protector of the Ottoman Orthodox population. On May 5th, Menshikov threatens to break off relations, but the British and French encourage the Ottomans to stand firm. French newspaper L'Union Franc-Contoise warns its readers of what is at stake. If we allow the Russians to take over Turkey, we will soon see the Greek heresy, Orthodox Christianity, imposed by Cossack arms on all of us. The Catholic religion will perish in the frozen deserts of Siberia, where those who raise their voices to defend it will be sent. St. Petersburg breaks off the negotiations. Ottoman politicians are divided between a peace party wanting compromise and a war party demanding resistance to Russia at all costs. But even the peace party agrees that the emperor must strengthen its military and look for allies in Europe. Ironically, this bolsters the war party and the Ottoman army mobilizes. Some historians even argue that these Ottoman defensive preparations may have actually increased the likelihood of war. The crisis continues for several months, until the Russians decide to force the Ottomans to relent. Russian troops move into the Danubian principalities of Moldovia and Wallachia, which are formally under Ottoman control. Britain and France pledge to support the Ottomans, and since the Ottomans can't afford to maintain mobilization for long, they declare war on Russia on October 4th, 1853. The Eastern War, which will later become known as the Crimean War, begins in 1853. For now, it is yet another Russo-Turkish War, this time with even more religious aspects than usual. Historians will later debate about whether religion or geopolitics play a larger role in the outbreak of the war, which some will call the Last Crusade. Tsar Nicholas, for his part, insists that his motives are pure. I am waging war neither for worldly advantages nor for conquests, but for a solely Christian purpose. All the powers make grandiose statements about religion, but their geopolitical goals are much more concrete. The Russians want to dismember the Ottoman Empire. They plan to annex some territory and create Russian-friendly states in the Balkans. This would allow them to reach their long-term goal of dominating the Turkish Straits. The Ottomans want to preserve their empire, get back control of the Russian-occupied Danubian principalities, and create independent states in Georgia, Crimea, and Circassia with eventual British and French help. To achieve its goals, the Russian Empire has the world's largest army, with 900,000 regulars and 500,000 reservists. 
Supply limitations and the need to defend the vast borders of the empire means only a minority of the army is available to fight in the Balkans, Crimea, or the Caucasus. Despite efforts at modernization, the Ottoman army is poorly equipped and organized. Officials estimate that they have about 105,000 regulars and 104,000 reserves, but even they aren't entirely sure of the numbers. On the other hand, they do have modern Western artillery. By one calculation, the Ottoman government spends just 18 silver rubles annually per soldier, while the Russians spend 32, the French 85, and the British as much as 134. On the Black Sea, the Russian fleet does have modern warships, while the Ottoman fleet is much weaker. The Eastern War is an existential struggle for the Ottomans and a chance at imperial glory for the Russians, and it gets off to a dramatically one-sided start. The first battle of a war between two land powers happens in November 1853 at sea, and Ottoman navy orders from Patrona Pasha betray their desperation. The enemy's ships are at sea, and we cannot cope with them. If we put out to sea, we will be lost. The best thing is to fight them, if they come, as long as we have a gun left. If there be any danger of their capturing you, slip your cable, run your ships on shore, and let fire to them. Russian warships attack an Ottoman fleet anchored at Sinop, and the Russians use newly invented explosive shells for the first time in history. The results are devastating. They sink 11 Ottoman ships, giving Russia control of the Black Sea at the cost of negative publicity in British and French press over the so-called massacre at Sinop. The land campaigns begin along the Danube River. Russian leadership hopes that if they march into the mostly Christian Balkans, local people might revolt against the Muslim Ottomans. But Ottoman troops have taken up defensive positions along the river, and limited Russian attacks fail. The winter of 1853-54 is quiet, but 45,000 Russian troops take the offensive again in March 1854. They cross the Danube to attack the Ottoman fortresses of Vidin, which blocks the route to Russian-friendly Serbia, and Silistra. Silistra is well defended by 12,000 Ottoman troops, so the Russians besiege it. The garrison makes a good impression on British Captain James Butler. It was impossible not to admire the cool indifference of the Turks to danger. Three men were shot in the space of five minutes while throwing up earth from the new parapet, and they were succeeded by the nearest bystander, who took the spade from the dying man's hands and set to work as calmly as if he were going to cut a ditch by the roadside. Ottoman and Russian forces also fight several battles in the Caucasus, but minor Ottoman victories are offset by Russian counterattacks. Anti-Russian rebels in Georgia and Circassia are too weak to have a major impact. In June 1854, the Russians prepare to storm Silistra, but two hours before the planned start of the attack, Russian units receive orders to leave, because the war has taken on a new character. While Ottoman and Russian forces are fighting, diplomatic talks have been going on in Vienna. When the Ottomans and Russians can't agree on peace terms, Britain and France give Russia an ultimatum. Leave the Danubian principalities or face the consequences. Russia refuses, so in March 1854, Britain and France declare war on Russia. The Eastern War is now a great power war. Britain's goals are to block Russian expansion, prevent Russian control of the Straits, and protect its commercial interests. Politicians propose different solutions, like returning Finland to Sweden, an independent Poland, and neutral Prussia annexing the Baltics. Lord Palmerston is among the most hawkish and hopes to weaken Russia as a long-term rival. The French joined the war to gain prestige and influence, to protect their commercial interests, and to support national unification movements of smaller peoples when convenient to French interests. Napoleon III is also ideologically opposed to Tsarist autocracy. The new British-French Ottoman alliance has the world's best army and best navy. The French army has about 439,000 men and excels not only in combat, but also in logistics. The British Army is more old-fashioned and only has 153,000 men. And most of these are spread throughout the empire, so only 21,500 are available to help the Ottomans. The Army's weaknesses are inexperienced officers and difficulties with organization and supply. Both the French and the British have new mass-produced rifles that outrange the Russians. 
On the seas, the Allied navies have 60 ships of the line, both sail and screw driven, against 40 Russian. But in total, the Allies have about 400 warships of all types, while the Russians have less than 100. If you want to learn more about the Crimean War at sea, by the way, check out Drachinefel's video on the topic. He's probably the best naval historian on YouTube and goes into much more detail about the wetter parts of this war. Just click on the link in the video description. The Franco-British Declaration outrages many Russians, like nationalist author Mikhail Pagodin. France takes Algeria from Turkey, and almost every year England annexes another Indian principality. But when Russia occupies Moldavia and Wallachia, albeit only temporarily, that disturbs the balance of power. We can expect nothing from the West but blind hatred and malice, which does not understand and does not want to understand. The Allies promised to send more than 100,000 troops to the Black Sea port of Varna to fight alongside the Ottomans, part of the reasons the Russians withdraw from their siege of Silistra. On the diplomatic front, the Sultan allows Austria to temporarily occupy the Danubian principalities so that the Russians will leave. Habsburg Emperor Franz Josef mobilizes 280,000 men and demands a Russian withdrawal. Vienna fears a stronger Russian presence in the Balkans may encourage revolts among the Slavic peoples in the Austrian Empire, as some had risen up in 1848. If Austria joins the war, the Russian army in the Balkans will be in grave danger, so the Tsar withdraws and Austrian units arrive in the principalities unopposed. Some Bulgarians leave with the Russians rather than stay under Ottoman rule. British and French troops, meanwhile, do land at Varna, but there's nothing for them to do. After the Russian retreat from the Danube, the Balkan front is quiet. Now that the British and French are also in the war, the Crimean War comes to Crimea. The British and French High Command plan to use their naval superiority to send their armies, who are still in disease-ridden camps in Varna, to invade the strategically important Crimean Peninsula on the Black Sea. Their main objective is to capture the city of Sevastopol and its Russian naval base. Allied commanders expect a quick campaign despite logistical problems, like the fact that they lack good maps of the region. The Allied fleet of 400 ships lands 60,000 mainly French, but also British and Ottoman troops at Yevpatoria on September 14, 1854. Many are already sick with cholera, and the lack of transport means that they need to confiscate supplies from local Tatar civilians. Russia doesn't place as much importance on the peninsula and doesn't expect a landing so late in the season, so they're taken by surprise and only have 25,000 men in Crimea. The Allied army under Lord Raglan and Maréchal Jacques Leroy de Saint-Arnaud now marches on Sevastopol. Russian commander Prince Alexander Menchikov maneuvers his troops onto the heights above the Alma River to block their path. The Allies attack on September 20th and soon run into trouble despite the support of their fleet's guns from just off the coast. Lord Raglan delays his advance so the French can break through first, exposing his waiting men to the fire of the Russian artillery. As the French assault goes in, Lieutenant Culet watches his comrades advance. In front of us, the Zouaves and the Marine infantry pushed back the enemy skirmishers, crossed the Alma and boldly began to climb the heights. A hail of Russian projectiles passed over the heads of our leading brigade and churned up the earth around us. Part of the French attack gets bogged down, French commanders demand British support, and Lord Raglan finally gives the order. British troops cross the river and charge up the hills straight into the teeth of the Russian defense. Ensign Hugh Ansley is in the middle of it all. We had got within 30 or 40 yards of the entrenchment, when a musket ball hit me full in the mouth. I thought it was all over with me. Just then, we got the order to retire. I turned round and ran as fast as I could down the hill to the river. The Russians counter-attack, but the British recover and stop the enemy thanks to accurate fire from their modern Minier rifles. Russian officer Eduard Totleben witnesses the futility of the advance. The enemy, Perfectly convinced of the superiority of his small arms, avoided close combat. Every time our battalions charged, he retired for some distance and began a murderous fusillade. Our columns only succeeded in suffering terrible losses and were obliged to fall back before reaching the enemy. 
Following the actions at Alma, several British soldiers will retroactively receive the first ever Victoria Crosses introduced at the end of the war. Meanwhile, the French and Ottomans successfully storm the heights on their side of the Allied line. Russian morale breaks and the Allies are victorious, but in just three hours they lose about 3,600 men and the Russians nearly 5,000. Both sides leave their wounded unattended, as a Russian orderly recalls. Hundreds of wounded have been deserted by their regiments, and these, with heart-rendering cries and moans and pleading gestures, begged to be lifted onto the carts and carriages. One man had his leg blown off and his jaw smashed with his tongue torn out. Only the expression on his face pleaded for a mouthful of water. After the Allied victory at the Alma, the way to Sevastopol lies open, but the victors don't know it. Following their success at the Alma, Raglan and Saint Arnaud don't realize how weak the Russians are. So two days go by before they begin to march around Sevastopol to its supposedly weaker southern flank. The Allies also take Balaclava and make its harbor their primary supply base, while most Russian forces withdraw to the peninsula's interior. The Allies now lay siege to Sevastopol, set up camp, and dig entrenchments and redoubts to protect themselves from the Russian garrison. British Captain Radcliffe describes routine trench duty. A few men were placed on the lookouts, their heads a few inches above the work, to give notice when the Russians fired, by watching the smoke from the guns by day and the flash by night, and calling out shot, when all in the trenches lie down and get under cover of the breastwork till it has passed, and then resume their work. The Russians now hatch a plan to sever the Allied supply route from Balaclava and destroy the harbour, which would force the Allies to leave Sevastopol. The Russians attack at daybreak on October 25th. The 500 Ottoman troops defending the first redoubt offer strong resistance, but are eventually driven out. This defeat breaks the morale of the other Allied defenders, and soon only the British 93rd Division stands between the Russians and the harbour. The British once again rely on the stopping power of their rifles and form a line. Reporter William Howard Russell is there. The Russians dash at the Highlanders. The ground flies beneath their horses' feet, gathering speed. At every stride, they dash on towards that thin red streak topped with a line of steel. These words are later and forever misquoted as a thin red line. Accurate British fire forces the Russians to abandon the attack, and with more Allied reinforcements on the way, the Russians withdraw from two of the redoubts and take the Allied cannons as booty. Lord Raglan's pride is so hurt that he orders his troops to recapture the guns, but the commanders on the ground don't understand which guns he means. In the confusion, the British Light Cavalry Brigade mistakenly charges straight into the Russians' main force. After reaching the Russian lines and taking heavy casualties, the brigade retreats, an infamous action that becomes a symbol of officer incompetence and inspires Lord Tennyson to write an immortal poem. The Battle of Balaclava ends in a limited Russian victory, despite not quite reaching the harbour. The Tsar, though, is encouraged, so he orders more attacks against the British and French at Inkerman Ridge. If the Russians take Inkerman, they can fire their cannons into the rear of the Allied siege lines. They plan to attack the British sector of the line, which they consider weaker than the French. On November 5th, 50,000 Russians attack just 16,000 Allied troops, but the thick fog confuses Russian command and control. The battle develops into a series of chaotic small-scale actions, with the Russians taking redoubts before losing them to British counterattacks. Russian confusion prevents planned diversionary attacks against French positions. French troops now come to the aid of their hard-pressed British allies, leading to dramatic scenes in the memoirs of French soldier Louis Noir. It's time to finish them, the Zouaves cried impatiently. Suddenly, Bosquet turned and drew his sword, placed himself at the head of his Zouaves, and pointing his sword towards the 20,000 Russian troops, shouted in a thunderous voice, En avant, à la bayonnette. The French charge shakes the Russians, whose officers can't even locate their own reserves. The Zouaves pour fire into the wavering Russian ranks, which soon forces the Russians to pull back. The Battle of Inkerman is clearly an Allied victory. They protect their lines of communication and inflict 12,000 casualties on the Russians, while taking just 4,300 of their own. 
The British could little afford the losses they'd suffered, but Russian hopes to relieve Sevastopol in 1854 are crushed. After the Allied victory at Inkerman, the fighting in Crimea settles in for the winter, with the Allies holding a small bridgehead in the southwest. Meanwhile, the war has a major impact elsewhere. European media might focus on Crimea, but there's also fighting on new fronts. The powerful Royal Navy leads Allied efforts in the Baltic Sea, where it hopes to attack the Russian ships at Rival. But the Russian fleet withdraws, and the British vessels bombard several Russian coastal outposts with little result. On August 8, 1854, French troops land on the Russian-controlled Baltic Åland Islands and besiege the fortress of Bomarsund, forcing the garrison's surrender. The Allies offer the islands to Sweden if it will join the war, but the Swedes refuse, so the Allies leave and the Russians return. Allied ships also sail much farther afield, launching several attacks in the Arctic White Sea, and in the Pacific, they attempt an aborted landing on the coast of Kamchatka. On the diplomatic front, the Kingdom of Sardinia joins the Allies in January 1855 and sends 15,000 troops to Crimea. King Victor Emmanuel and the Count of Cavour hope that by joining France, they can gain Napoleon III's support for Italian unification under the House of Savoy. The winter of 1854-55 is a long one for the Russian soldiers and civilians trapped in Sevastopol and for the blockading Allied troops. Disease has been running rampant since the start of the war, and both Raglan and Saint Arnaud die from dysentery or cholera. The Allies also suffer from extreme logistical problems. Ottoman commanders rely on the Allies for resupply, and their troops are short of food. British Admiral Adolphus Slade, serving with the Ottomans as Mushaver Pasha, criticizes Ottoman officers' unwillingness to complain on their own troops' behalf. For the Pashas serving the Allies, the loss of a thousand men was not to be named in the same breath with the loss of the English general's smile. The British are totally unprepared for the cold weather, but the French are much better equipped. Suffering British troops write letters home complaining about the army's inability to care for them. In fact, during the Crimean War, the public is flooded with news like never before. Thanks to new technology like the Telegraph, French, British and Russian readers can follow and react to events on the battlefield thousands of kilometers away within just a day or two. Journalists like William Howard Russell become famous for their war reporting, and their articles are often accompanied by another innovation – photographs. These are mostly posed shots of officers and serve up a sanitized version of the war for propaganda, but the overall media effect is palpable. British poet Edmund Gosse is one of those connected to the war through media. The declaration of war with Russia brought the first breath of outside life into our Calvinist cloister. My parents took in a daily newspaper, which they had never done before, and events in picturesque places, which my father and I looked at on the map, were eagerly discussed. The media frenzy and the speed of news from the front also means that the public can react to events and pressure governments like never before. One name in the news is British nurse Florence Nightingale, who rises to fame for her work as an administrator at a British hospital near Constantinople. Despite her important impact in professionalizing nursing, there's still a heated debate today about whether she actually reduces the death rate of her hospital's patients. The terrible conditions in Crimea and the disaster of the Light Brigade at Balaclava become major scandals and even help force Prime Minister Lord Aberdeen to resign in January 1855. He is replaced by the more aggressive Palmerston. The Russians also have problems with supply and medical care, but there's at least one positive. Surgeon Nikolai Pirogov engineers the system of medical triage to treat life-threatening cases more efficiently a system that other armies only adopt in the First World War. Thanks to his work, wounded Russian soldiers have higher survival rates than their Allied counterparts, especially after amputations. Conditions in Sevastopol, though, are still miserable, as artillery officer Leo Tolstoy observes. We have no army. We have a horde of slaves cowed by discipline, ordered about by thieves and slave traders. This horde is not an army because it possesses neither any real loyalty to faith, Tsar and fatherland, words that have been much misused, nor valor, nor military dignity. All it possesses are on the one hand, passive patience and repressed discontent, and on the other, cruelty, servitude and corruption. 
The soldiers are suffering, but so are the civilians. Most of the population are Crimean Tatars, a Muslim people who speak a Turkic language. The Tsarist government suspects them of Ottoman sympathies and adopts repressive policies, including frequent individual deportations to Central Asia. During the war, some Tatars escape and resettle in the Ottoman Balkans, and the Russians replace them with Christians fleeing the Balkans and Slavs from other parts of the empire. After the war, the Crimean Tatars become a minority in their own homeland for good. The war is being felt in Crimea and across Europe, even as prime ministers and monarchs come and go. Tsar Nicholas dies in March 1855 and is succeeded by his son Alexander, just in time for a major defeat. In spring 1855, the Allies are determined to take Sevastopol to the point of neglecting their efforts in the Baltic and in the Caucasus. Royal Navy ships block Russian supply routes through the Sea of Azov, and British and French industrial might makes itself felt. A new railway line allows them to fire more than 160,000 shells into Sevastopol in April alone. This marks the first time that railroad technology is used this way in war. Allied ground forces capture the city's outer defensive on June 6th and attack the Malakov and Great Redan redoubts on June 18th at French request on the anniversary of the Battle of Waterloo. The plan is for the French to attack the Malakov first, followed by a British attack on the Redan. Militarily unnecessary if the French succeed, but Raglan wants to preserve British honor. French soldier Herbe is shocked when Russian officers cross no man's land the night before the assault. The Russians said to us, Allons, messieurs les Français. When you are ready, we shall be waiting. It was obvious that the enemy knew all our plans and that we would find a well-prepared defense. The first French and British attacks fail completely. The first Russian volley takes out a third of the British attackers and the rest flee despite their officers threatening to shoot them. Russian Empire soldier Prokofi Podpalov remembers the slaughter. Suddenly, the enemy came towards us in a huge wave. Our bugle sounded followed by the booming of our cannon and the firing of our guns. It was so dark from the gun smoke that nothing could be seen. When it cleared, we could see that the ground in front of us was covered with the bodies of the British fallen. The Allies lose 7,500 men for nothing. This stalemate continues into its 10th month. There are more and more cases of trench fatigue, and Louis Noir even sees battle-hardened Zouave wake up from nightmares screaming for help against imaginary enemies. The Russians are losing 250 men a day whom they cannot replace, and in July, Allied shelling kills Sevastopol commander Admiral Pavel Nakhimov. The Tsar knows his army is running out of time with the Sea of Azov supplies cut off, so in August, the Russians launch an attack on the Allied watering places on the Chernaya River. The 30,000 Russian infantry outnumber the 9,000 Sardinians and 18,000 French defenders, but the Russians lack cavalry or artillery, and the Allies have the high ground. Russian troops launch a frontal assault with unclear orders, which goes nowhere. They lose 8,000 dead and wounded for nothing. The Allies try again in September. They extend their trenches to within just 50 meters of the Russian positions, but lose 200 men daily to Russian sharpshooters. The plan is again for the French to attack Malakhov first, followed by the British at Redan. When the French attack on September 8th, they catch the Russians by surprise. Prokofi Podpalov remembers. The French are in the Malakhov before our boys had a chance to grab their guns. In a few seconds, they had filled the fort with hundreds of their men and hardly a shot was fired from our side. At Redan, the British try and fail three times. A bitter memory for Lieutenant Griffith. We rushed madly along the trenches, grape shot flying about our ears and the men falling down on all sides. When I got to the edge of the ditch of the Redan, Radcliffe and I got hold of a ladder, went up it to the top of the parapet where we were stopped by the press. Wounded and dead men kept tumbling down on us. Panicked British infantrymen again retreat to their lines, this time after 2,600 casualties. Their officers order another attack, but there's no need. Since the French have taken Malakhov, Redan cannot be held and the Russians withdraw. Russian command now sees the writing on the wall and orders an evacuation of Sevastopol. 
Nurse Alexandra Stachova is in the midst of the disaster. The whole city was engulfed in flames. From everywhere, the sounds of explosions. It was a scene of terror and chaos. Sevastopol was covered in black smoke. Our own troops were setting fire to the town. The siege of Sevastopol is over. The cost of 102,000 Russian and 71,000 Allied lives. Back in St. Petersburg, Tsar Alexander is defiant. Sevastopol is not Moscow. The Crimea is not Russia. Two years after the burning of Moscow in 1812, our victorious troops were in Paris. We are still the same Russians, and God is with us. By late 1855, the Allies and the Russians are exhausted, and winter is coming. On the Caucasus front, Russians capture the besieged city of Kars on November 26th, despite the efforts of the Anglo-Ottoman garrison. This leaves Russia in control of more enemy territory than the Allies, a bargaining chip for peace talks. Simultaneously, the British assemble a powerful Baltic fleet called the Grand Armament of 1856 to finish the war the next year. Some historians suggest that the threat of this fleet helps end the war, even though it never sees action. That's because Napoleon III is satisfied with French victories and wants peace. In January 1856, the French reject British proposals to open new fronts, and the two nations decide to end the Crimea campaign. The French now approach the neutral Austrians, and the two powers present Russia with an ultimatum. The Tsar cannot risk Austrian intervention, so negotiations begin in Paris. At first, the French and British argue, since the British insist on harder terms, but in the end the French prevail and the Treaty of Paris is signed on March 30, 1856. Russia agrees to give parts of Bessarabia back to Moldova, renounce influence over the Danubian principalities, accept demilitarization of the Black Sea, and abandon its claim to represent Ottoman Christians. The Ottoman Empire's pre-war boundaries are preserved, plus some small gains in Bessarabia, a major victory for Constantinople. The Treaty of Paris, though, is not a long-term answer to the Eastern question, and the Concert of Europe is restless. Russia still wants to expand south as soon as it can regain its strength. The Ottomans are more integrated into European affairs, but they're still weak, and outside interference in Ottoman affairs continues. Austria is isolated and will find itself without allies in the coming wars against France, Sardinia, and Prussia. Britain remains the main global power, but there is public disappointment at scandals and heavy losses for the sake of preserving the Ottomans. France, on the other hand, gains international prestige, ends the war on its terms, and solidifies the new emperor's authority. As for the Sardinians, the kingdom improves its relations with France, which will bear fruit in future wars for Italian unification. For regular soldiers, nurses, and civilians, though, geopolitics are a distant reality from the pain and the loss of war. Russia loses about 450,000 dead, the French around 100,000, the Ottomans some 45,000, the British 22,000, and the Sardinians 2,300. Most of the men die of disease, not from combat. Aside from being deadly, the Crimean War is also a transitional conflict. It is partly a traditional cabinet war, and is the last European war where religion is used as a primary justification. But it's also modern in terms of technology, science, media, and cultural aspects, the first industrial war. Some even consider it the first modern war, though that debate still rages on today, when another modern war has come to Crimea. Of course, any technological advance comes with new challenges for simple humans like us who need to use these new gadgets. In 1853, that cutting-edge telegraph connection brought with it its own set of problems like messages being intercepted. And 170 years later, the issue is not so different if you look at browsing the internet and trying to use secure passwords so you can safely do your online shopping or watch the latest real-time history videos on YouTube. That's why password managers like NordPass are so important and useful. With NordPass, you can generate unique and secure passwords for every account, store them in your own vault without the need to memorize each password, and with the autofill feature, you don't need to type in each password either, which makes all your online activities faster and more convenient. 
And the best thing, when you're regularly traveling like me and want to maintain that level of security and convenience, you can take NordPass with you and use it on multiple devices. This is not just super helpful for the passwords you need on the go, but you can also safely store other data in your NordPass. As sponsor of this video, NordPass has a special deal for you at nordpass.com slash realtimehistorypass. Save 36% on a two-year plan of NordPass and get an entire month for free. You can try NordPass for 30 days, and if you're not satisfied, you get your money back. That's nordpass.com slash realtimehistorypass for a special offer that also supports our channel. We'd like to thank David Lang and Mark Newton for their help with this episode. And as usual, you can find all our sources in the video description below. If you're watching this on Patreon or Nebula, thank you so much for your support. We couldn't do it without you. I'm Jesse Alexander, and this is a production of Real Time History, the only YouTube history channel that wants to remind you that the Tsar himself said Crimea is not Russia. <laughs>